Is Jesus First Love, Episode 84, the intro? Where's the outrage? Where's the outrage? Have you seen it? Have you heard it? Have you felt it? Where did it go? God's outrage, Numbers 32 and 13. So the Lord's anger was aroused against Israel, and he made them wander in the desert for 40 years. God's outrage. And Samuel said to Saul, You have done foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. Your kingdom shall not continue. God's outrage. David, regarding David and Uriah. You remember David had his friend Uriah murdered so that David could have Uriah's wife. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up adverse adversity against you from your own house, his own children. And I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives. Jesus' outrage. Now we're talking about outrage, outrage. Jesus' outrage. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. Therefore, you will receive greater condemnation. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel land and sea to win one proselyte, and when he is one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. Woe to you blind guides who say, whoever swears by the temple, it is nothing. But whoever swears by the gold of the temple, he is obliged to perform it. Fools and blind, for which is greater, the gold or the temple that sanctifies the gold? Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe the mint and anise and cumin, and you have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice <coughs> and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. Do you hear the outrage of your Jesus? Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of extortion and self-indulgence. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the monuments of the righteous and say, if we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have partaken with them in the blood of the prophets. Therefore, you are witnesses against yourselves that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your father's guilt. Serpents, brood of vipers, how can you escape the condemnation of hell? Outrage, outrage, outrage. Jesus is outraged. He said to them, all too well you reject the commandments of men, speaking to the Pharisees, that you may keep your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and mother, and he who curses father and mother, let him be put to death. But you say, if a man says to his father or mother, whatever profit you might have received from me is korban, that is a gift to God, then you no longer let him do anything for his father 
or his mother, making the word of God of no effect through your tradition, which you have handed down, and many such things you do. Jesus is outraged. Later he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table, and he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart because they did not believe. Jesus is outraged to the church in Sardis. I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not, for I have not found your works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. Outrage, outrage. Jesus is outrage. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot, so then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Peter's outrage. Ananias regarded Ananias with Sapphira. You remember. Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to God. You have not lied to men, but to God. Outrage, outrage, outrage. Peter's outrage. Another sample. When Simon saw that through the laying of the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money saying, Give me this power also, that anyone on whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, Your money perish with you, because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither part nor portion in this matter, for your heart is not right in the, son of, in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this your wickedness, and pray, God, if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. Outrage, outrage. Stephen's outrage. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers. Paul's outrage, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portray portrayed among you as crucified. Paul's outrage, again, to the Corinthians. I fear that somehow your pure and undevoted devotion to Christ will be corrupted just as Eve was deceived by the cunning ways of the serpent. Outrage, outrage. Lots of outrage. Back then, lots of outrage. Jane's outrage. If you don't believe me, go to the, if you're not convinced, go to your Bible, go to Biblegate, and just type in the search bar, anger, or anger of the Lord, and you will see it come up many, many times. Okay, James is outraged. Come now, you rich. Weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded and their corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasure in the last days. And they, indeed, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, cry out, and the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. 
You have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury. You have fattened your hearts as in a day of slaughter. Okay. God's outrage against his people is evident to any reader of the Old Testament and Jesus' outrage and that of many others is clearly evident in the earliest church to any reader of the New Testament. But, but, but where is the outrage against the daily theft within evangelicalism today? My very first writing, my very first writing, and I, I said this before, I prayed in the Spirit for months asking that the Lord would give me interpretation. And what I wrote was way above me, way above my understanding. Here it goes. Today, the same enemy has raised the same army of spokesmen to wrestle, to wrestle the same word from the same church. But unfortunately, there is no Paul. At least I haven't heard of him or her indignation is scarce men are not men and women are not women the adders and subtractors have paved various ways negotiators and compromisers see each other in places of prominence the lordship of christ in heaven the lordship of christians on earth where is the retaliation evangelicalism is packed with adders and subtractors, with compromisers and negotiators. Evangelicalism's supposed leadership, to quote myself, see each other in places of prominence. Where is the outrage? Weekly, pastors claiming to be God's agents mercilessly, systematically fleece Christ's sheep. Where is the outrage? Pastors' non-biblical salary often, usually, surpasses the average wage of his trusting congregation. There is no similarity between Pastor Whoever and Paul, or Barnabas, or the Eleven. Where is the outrage? Christ's Great Commission is a forgotten commission. Few give thought to the thousands entering eternal perdition every day of the year. Most of evangelicals, evangelical donations are spent on themselves. They pay a pastor to look after them. They, they purchase a building that they can sit in on Sunday mornings and the rest of the, the, rest of the week mostly empty. Most of the money that they think is a gift is actually just looking after themselves. Where is the outrage? The buying and selling of God's truth has evolved into a billion dollar industry. Demands are made by most for payment for Christian service. Evangelical leadership competes with Jesus for the loyalty and affection of Christ's blood-washed saints. This is evidenced by the fact that evangelicals obey commandments of men over the word of God. Pastor whoever long ago supplanted the governance of the Holy Spirit with himself. Where is the outrage? Segment one, relationship, relationship, relationship. It was Jesus' relationship with the Father that outraged him. Then his disciples, remember when Jesus made a whip and remember when he chased out the money changers and upset their tables, turned them over 
And do you remember the disciples? Then his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house has eaten me up. That zeal for the Father's house came out of Jesus' Jesus' relationship with the Father. And it was Peter's relationship with Jesus that outra outraged Peter. The same with Paul. And the same with A.W. Tozer. Tozer was an enraged person, enraged against the waste that was so evident in his day, and even more, and that is even more evident in our day. Love for others is outraged by abuse of others. Love for others is outraged by abuse of others. Segment two, the judgment seat of Christ. From a Facebook friend, Laura Goss, when a church changes biblical truth and standards to match current culture, they're no longer following the Bible, they're following the lost. I would add, such people will suffer eternal loss of rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. Jordan B. Peterson, when you have something to say, silence is a lie. There is such a thing as righteous indignation. That's me speaking now. There is such a thing as righteous indignation. Those lacking righteous indignation should not and expect should not expect an abundance of rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. Dr. Kendra Becker, I got this from Facebook. Never forget that you have every right to question any individual, system, movement, or group that only tolerates you when you think and behave exactly like them. I have, I add to this, you do not have a right to remain silent. You do not have a right to remain silent when brothers and sisters are being mercilessly fleeced Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. Not only of their money, but their devotion to Jesus Christ. Segment three, does Jesus hate evangelicalism? That question can be answered with a few questions. Is evangelicalism good or is evangelicalism bad? Is evangelicalism the good tree producing good fruit or the bad tree bearing bad fruit? Segment four, only stupid people go to hell. Jesus is outraged. <laughs> this is directed to those not yet born again of the Holy Spirit, but hopefully will soon be. Jesus is outraged because the church to whom he commissioned to reach you with the good news of, the self, of his salvation grossly misspends the income he provides to them on themselves. Mahatma, Mahatma Gandhi said something like this. I'm going by memory. I'm very close. If it weren't for Christians, I would be one. If it weren't for Christians, I would be one. Nonetheless, you have heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, and there is a part of you that recognizes truth when you hear it. Do you have the courage to respond to Christ's great salvation, knowing that in doing so, you must stop following your crowd the people that you bunch with. Not only do stupid people go to hell, not only do prideful people go to hell, but also the cowardly, Revelation 21 and 8, but the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, adulterers, and all liars shall have their part in the lake of, which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Notice, that the first on that long, lengthy list is the cowardly. Do you have the courage to do what you know in your heart of hearts is the right thing to do? 
Segment 5, LarryJones.ca, a quotation from A Catholic No More. And this is the epilogue. And it goes like this. Written about 45, 47 years ago. Revival. Revival. Another chance. Revival. Restricted to backsliders. Revival, a beautiful word, like love and peace and goodness and joy, a beautiful word. The word sends shivers of hope and excitement throughout the prodigal heart. It arouses memories of yesterday when Jesus was king, when life was as it should be, when purpose was wholesome, when fruit was evident, when friends were blessed by one's very presence. Revival. The good shepherd has found the lost sheep. The lost coin has been found and the woman is dancing. Heaven celebrates and hell is in remorse. Prodigal son. The prodigal son. I am tired of this pigsty and I hate pigs. Why should I stay in this muck and stench when I have a father who is loaded? I'm dirty, I'm hungry, and I stink. I'm out of here. I will say to my father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. Several times every day, the old man surveys the horizon where he last saw his son's frame diminish with every hurried step until he was no more gone. My son, my son, why, why did you leave? What did you not have? All my possessions I shared with you. You slept in a fine bed. You sat at my table while servants waited on us. Are you ever coming home? Are you still alive? And then, and then, my son, is that him coming over the hill? That's him, I know his stride. His fat is gone and his clothes are rags, but that's my boy. Servants, servants, quick, Bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it. Let's party. My son was lost and now is found. Revival. Promise. Mm. Beautiful promise. If my people who were called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Promise. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1 and 9. Promise. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent, says Jesus. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Revelations 3, 19 and 20. Promise. The Lord your God is gracious and merciful and will not turn his face from you if you return to him. 2 Chronicles 30 and 9. Promise. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Matthew eleven twenty eight. Promise. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Isaiah 55 and 7. <sighs> Revival, 
a return trip to Calvary, revival, kneeling once again on the bloodied ground, revival for the humble only, the proud must bear their burdens. Jesus, the master builder and the master rebuilder, Jesus, he can mend the broken life, Jesus, he will forgive. Revival, Jesus, I come to you now, revival. I choose you, Jesus, revival. Jesus again takes his rightful place on the throne of the contrite heart. Revival breaks the charismatic cycle. Revival breaks the awful evangelical cycle. Jesus, sin bearer, advocate. Jesus, coming king. Jesus, elder brother. Jesus. Segment six, let my people go. <laughs> you are his people. Evangelicals, you are his people. And as God said to Pharaoh to let his people go, he says to all those who have authority, over you, supposed authority, let my people go. He says to you, pastor, whoever, let my people go. He says to every denominational officer, let my people go. I encourage you to read, let my people go. Segment seven prayer. I pray for you, you pray for me. <clears throat> the Lord said, not by power, not by might, but my, by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. He is the Lord of hosts. Father God, not by power, not by might, but by your spirit, but by your spirit. May I pray by your, may I do some good for every person who would lift their hand to your son, Jesus. Lord, you say, you said in your word, you give grace to the humble. Lord, it takes humility to raise their hand to your son, Jesus. But I pray for them, Lord. I pray that they would return to first love. They would return to that enthusiasm and that passion that they once had when first born of the Spirit. Lord, I pray that they would recover that passion and that zeal that, you, that they had and that was taken from them. Set them free from religion, Father. Set them free, I ask in the name of Jesus in whom you were and whom you are well pleased. And now, Lord Jesus Christ, head of the church, rabbi, teacher, healer, great shepherd of the sheep, God of Israel, master, savior, redeemer, I ask you, my Lord, to touch physically every person that has their hand raised to you, Lord Jesus Christ. And I pray for 84, episode 84, as I done, have done past episodes, to the degree that this episode contains truth, your truth, Lord. To that degree, stretch forth your hand to heal. To that degree, signs and wonders and miracle healings. Lord, I'm not asking that you touch some, and I'm not asking that you touch most, but I'm asking that you touch every person, Lord Jesus, that in humility have their hands raised to you. And I thank you, Jesus. And I thank you, Jesus. 
and I worship you, Jesus, and I exalt your name, Jesus. Amen and amen. And now, my brothers in Christ, my sisters in Christ, a few seconds, <clears throat> pray for me, if you would be so kind. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Catch you next time.